this is this is this is. So uh, I I will try not to mention this ever again, but we are experiencing a heat wave here in the Pacific Northwest where I live. Uh, my small town of Bremerton, Washington, it's 102 degrees right now. I don't know if you can see. Wow. Jeez. I, and that's I Fahrenheit. Actually, I did so. see something on the news earlier because um, I know Northern California is renowned for being quite cold and, and, and north of that as well. And then I saw like it's really hot in like Vancouver seattle washington and san francisco i was like whoa that's that's unusual that's it's really in, crazy it's insane it's breaking records degrees. that's crazy yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so we, we broke a record yesterday uh, the record was 103 and then it went to 104 so that broke and then they're supposed to break a record today already it'll be 106 later in the day no ac in the wow. studio as well no way. Oh, man. <laughs> no way. I, di- I didn't know you were based up there dude i thought you were a socal boy are you originally southern california no, no. Uh, we just love that SoCal sound, I think. You know? oh, yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of people, you know, and, and we definitely play, play uh, we've played down in SoCal so many times. And we started, yeah, yeah. even though we started up here, people kind of saw us for the first time in big groups down in Southern California, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Washington is, is a lot like the, the weather in England, usually, but... Uh, <laughs> We're pulling away. I think we're getting a little hotter than you guys a little these days. But <laughs> that's a good thing, man. <laughs> yeah, that's not hard either. <laughs> yeah. So where are you guys calling from? Where are you at right now? Birmingham. 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 That's yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so proper Peaky Blinders town in the middle of the country. Is that where uh, Peaky Blinders is originated or, or what? I, I've never seen the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, they film it there as well. They film it in the Midlands, but um, yeah, it's like where they originally was from as well. Nice, nice. rainbow. So, yeah, man. I always enjoy that. <laughs> good time, good time. I always have good shows there and good people. Yeah, for sure. I've got some stories yeah, as well, but we'll get into. <laughs> uh, I want to hear about your guys' stories. Uh, I've been checking out your new record, Primary Colors. Oh, Sounds no, amazing. Sure. Before we get into that, I should just let everybody know, Christian, you're the bass player. Yeah. Jack, singer, guitar player. Yeah. And uh, and who's missing from the group? We can sh- shout them out too. Yeah, so we've got Nathan who plays drums, and then Ch- Chino is our uh, lead guitarist. So all the like noodly bits on the record are, are Chino. The rhythm is obviously Jack. Cool, and cool. The sing- well, dude, yeah. guys, congratulations! Great record. Is this your first record or what? Record number one for? Yeah, so it's our, it's our first full length full length record, and we we self lot released an EP when we first sort of started out a few years back. Um, like a four track EP, but it's our first like full length record, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I I want to get into all the how tos, how the band got going, but I do want to just talk about this record because I just was listening to it before we 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 started, and uh, I'm just blown away. Really great songs, really cool. Awesome. You know, this the sound of your band is really great. Uh, reminds me of really classic music uh, out of the you know '90s. Uh, but modern, of course. But um, you know, like I'm sure you get you get compared to maybe like Weezer, Third Eye Blind, stuff like that. Maybe you don't, but uh, I heard some of that in your songs. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, okay. But these guys are taking it to doing what you're doing, and I really enjoyed just what it must have been like to put these songs together. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> what was it? Who's who's writing the songs? in the band so um our sort of process is that like i'll usually write about 80 percent of the song and then I'll, on, on an acoustic so mm-hmm. i'll just get it as simple as possible just lyrics and an acoustic guitar with me and then sort of when i'm happy with what i've done i take it sort of to the band and then say right let's fucking punk it up let's let's get it like grungy let's get it faster or you know what i mean just take it to the band to put our own spin on it so everyone sort of has their equal sort of input really obviously it differs from sort of like song to song but that's our sort of general process what we what we do basically and it seems to be a good formula at the moment for us is that what you guys have done since the very beginning so i guess we should just get into it when did you how long you been together uh it's been like four years maybe not even that really like what since we got chino in the band probably like probably just coming up to four years really um and yeah so i knew jack 
um, from back in like 2007. Um, and he played guitar in another band and I played guitar in another band and we'd share the stage together. But Jack was never a front man. And I remember watching him thinking that guy should should be the front man. Like he, he's, <laughs> he's like, he can, he can like sing harmonies perfectly. He can sing perfectly. And um, he's a great like rhythm guitar player. So um, it, fast forward to like 2017, I, I, you know, I was sort of thinking, man, like I need to get back into a band and I fired him a message and I, it sort of just snowballed from there. We got together, had a jam with our old drummer. We were a three piece for a little while. And then um, because of all the music, the, the sort of influences we all, we all share, um, like Tom Petty, the replacements, um, th- that all has like a lead guitar sort of theme running throughout. So we were like, well, we need to probably uh get a get a lead guitarist in and uh our new chino um is like a family friend of mine and got him in and, and yeah we sort of never looked back and yeah we just started you know putting songs together jack's a great songwriter and uh we all sort of have like our, our own sort of share in terms of like ideas going into song and jack's sort of quite really open-minded really for a songwriter he's like look guys like i've got this like but what do you think? And then we'll all throw our, you know, our two cents in and it just creates like this perfect storm um, of like cool sort of, I think it sounds really timeless and like, like um, in 10 years time, it will still sound as good. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's sort of how it wow. sort of happened. So it's, it's almost like putting a football team together or something. You gotta, you gotta yeah, figure yeah, well, out what you I'm, need, what you're missing. Yeah. It's like, with the like how I've grown up, I've always sort of played like sports and stuff as well. And I've always had this sort of team sort of mentality. And I think a lot of like the guys in the band, they'll like send me like names of like, like cool track names and stuff. So like about, I think four or five songs on the record came from either Christian or Dave or our old drummer, just sending through like ideas for like song names. And that just sparked something in my head to go and sort of create something from it. Cause I was just thinking like the, the, the name of the album, Primary Colours, came from Christian. He just said, he just sent it me on WhatsApp saying, that's a cool, cool title track. And I was like, yeah, man, I, I need to like write, that's just a hook in itself. So that sort of came from there. But yeah, I just, I love how we've all got this sort of, you know, we're an open band, like we talk a lot about our music and it's sort of, nothing's ever like personal. It's always just to make the song the best it can be, really. So you don't have necessarily conversations about this is the sound we want to go for. It just kind of comes out naturally because of your your influences. Tom Petty, of course, yeah. love. Yep, all that. Yeah, I think like sort of previously we haven't, but I think moving forward, I know like we've only just released our, our debut record, but we're yeah. sort of talking about number two just because we've had that sort of two year thing like space to wait. But like we're focusing more on like the sound of it now and like what sound we want to sort of go down because we've sort of as, as you know yourself it's just like a, a big process playing in a band and sort of getting everyone's you know like methods and stuff no that's you're right it, it's a it's a process you trust the process but then you don't always know what that's gonna gonna look like in the end <laughs> uh <laughs> well i want to talk about the record primary colors man like uh set in gold great song uh i just it hit me immediately when I heard, you know, just like the idea. I was like, that I, the idea of that is cool. Um, and that's kind of how I write songs is like if I have an idea that sticks with me, I keep, keep going with that idea and I keep, keep rolling with that. But I love the bridge. The bridge had a really, I don't know, a, a classic sound to it, something that like you were kind of saying, Christian, you know, you wanted a sound that's going to be perennial. You wanted something that's going to be lasting. No matter what happens in the trends, it's going to sound good. And I feel like, a lot of these songs are that, you know, and, and, and of course you can, you can reach back to some of the influences, some of the early 90s alternative and, and punk it up and stuff. But I think that's a great thing. I think there's, there's, there's not a lot of great music out there today doing that well. You know, <laughs> it, it's not, you guys aren't hacks at all. You're, you're doing some great songs here. So yeah, Set in Gold was awesome. Laura. And these are all singles you have videos for, at least a couple of these you have videos for. Um, Laura, great song. Really another kind of timeless sound where it could have been released 20 years ago. It could be released today, and it just sounds good. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> always the goal with my songwriting as well. Is, and, and I don't necessarily always, always achieve that goal, but 
these songs, they're for me on on the first couple of listens, it's already there. So I, I can see why Wiretap was like, "Hey, we want to release release in the U.S." Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a uh, Wiretap has been great because when when we finished the record, we sort of we kept our mind really open and like we, we were we were open to releasing it ourselves but we also sent it to everybody possible like to try and see what people's reactions would be so we sent it to major labels we sent it to big independents we sent it to tiny tiny independent labels just to see if we got a response and we did actually get quite a few responses and one of the common themes was the songs are great you look great blah 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 but we don't know how to market it whereas like sure. robert wiretap but Robert Wiretap was like, like, what the fuck? Like, this is so good. Like, this, all that matters to me is the songs, and that's like us. All that we care about is, is is making good songs. And Rob took the chance, and Wiretap's a great a great label to be a part of, and he's been really passionate about everything we've done. So um, we're stoked to be working with him. And it, we, we listened to uh, him on your podcast, and it was a, a, a really good listen, man. He's a good, really good guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. You know, you mentioned the songs. It really is about the songs. And, and I, I feel that from Rob and Wiretap, and I feel that from you guys. And, and I'm trying myself to, you know, to uh, just always just listen to the songs. You know, it doesn't matter... I'm a fan of Justin Bieber, honestly, because of the songs. So, you know, I don't know <laughs> all his songs, but some of the songs he's put out have been really good. And it's just like, okay, hey, the songs. that You can't go wrong if you just listen to the song. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, I feel you there because I'm a massive Harry Styles fan. I, yeah. think, he, I, think, I think he's great. Like, some of his songs, obviously not all of them. but You like, like Watermelon Sugar? Yeah, it's incredible. It gets like, in your head. You're like, I shouldn't like this song. This is not <laughs> punk rock at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's catchy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think like the thing is with our music, it's like you can't really sort of like pigeonhole it, pigeonhole it into sort of one genre. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think labels might look at it and be a bit like scared of that because they can't, as they say, they they can't market it, and it's it's not it's not hundred percent punk, but it's not hundred percent mm -hmm. indie. It's not hundred percent rock. It's got all these kind of like different influences in sure and like um i was brought up on like a lot of motown stuff like growing up in like the working class sort of middle of the country and that was my what my mom like my parents sort of always played so that sort of like pop sort of melodies i think they always come from that kind of space that sort of like 60s sort of vibe to it but then like you sort of mash it with like all the stuff i grew up on like you know like the Americana stuff, like listening to, you know, like Green Day, Social Distortion, and bands like that, and then like you, you get you get like this fusion of like this British sort of working class Americana thing, and we just think it was a really cool thing to do. Man, whatever whatever you got going on in the mesh, I really like it because it's I love the Clash, I love '90s alternative, you know, music, I love punk rock, I love all of that, I love '60s, you know, Motown, I like all of that stuff and it's sometimes it's hard to actually like write a good song with all that kind of mixed in but you guys whatever your style is man just keep that rolling i know it's going to develop it's going to change over the years don't be afraid of that either but uh yeah, yeah. man i feel like i'm just being a cheerleader but uh horizons nice. can we talk about horizons horizons <laughs> yeah. is a, a great song like i was like at first i was like wait what are you talking about skinny jeans <laughs> <laughs> so and i know you're t you're talking about like you and your friends having conversations can you talk about that a, a little bit about what the song's about or yeah man so um horizons is actually about sort of like a close friend of mine that moved he moved away he moved to australia and um it was just sort of like influenced by the conversations that i was having with him because he was just saying i'm sick of you know going day to day in my job i just want to have a big change and mm -hmm. go and sort of live my life a little bit a little bit better really and that sort of hit me hard and i was like shit like he's he's got the balls to go and do that that that's something to write about and yeah man it was just like sort of a feeling of like looking back at your 20s and thinking you know you want it to last forever and you do all the best things and and it was just sort of like reflecting on that, but then like looking towards the future as well, like this sign of hope and keeping like souvenirs and stuff from the past, but looking forward to kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that song. Like I remember when 
we you, you had like the guitar part originally like diddle and diddle and and we sort of we loved it but we sort of we were struggling at that point what to do with the song so it sat in a drop box for a while and mm. then we revisited it when we were getting closer to going out to record the record and then jack turned up to practice with it finished and uh yeah we were just like fuck like because it's like a really fast song and we're not really known for doing like overly fast songs like a lot of our songs are sort of a bit more mid tempo -y. but that was like a real sort of punch in the gut that song and i feel like lyrically it's and like with the with the, the big woes in there it's something that i could really see like people stage dive into and like <laughs> you know what i mean I, I love that and like i think you can sort of hear that in that in that song which is really nice it really sort of pulls out our sort of more punk rock sort of um influences into that song so yeah and lyrically it kind of it lends itself to that that scene too and and it's very visceral but um it's it's uplifting like it it it's triumphant in a way you feel like you're on top of the world when you listen to that song you know yeah and, man no, so I'm yeah sure. I'm got, yeah that's wicked that's what you want man like that's great <laughs> yeah uh, we want to make people feel good and it, we've got like this sort of running theme throughout the whole record that there's like this sign of hope like things have got to get better yeah and i think you know in the current climate we're like you know like covid and stuff i think we've dropped it at the perfect time because i think people need a record like ours you know what i mean it's not all sort of doom and gloom we've got to look at like the brighter side of things and the, the simple things in life and sort of you know the simple things in life are the best things in, in my mind and i think that's sort of we're trying to in, in my lyrics, anyway, that's what I was trying to sort of do with this record. Sure. Primary Colors, good example. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love the guitar solo, the guitar vibes in general on the whole record. Uh, the the bass lines, too, you know, really cool bass lines. Well done, Christian. Cheers, man. And you, you know what? Like, um, I always, I'm sort of a bit. Uh, self-deprecating a little bit because I, I call myself a root note reggie as in like all i do is play, <laughs> play the root notes but sometimes that's what works you know what i mean yeah. and then every now and then I'll, I'll be a little bit you know i might add an extra note or two in there but on that song in the in the um in the pre-choruses yeah I, I add a little little bit of a uh, extra spice to it but you, I, I i think with bass like it's about being tasteful and it's like you you play you play bass you're a bass player it's not always about like don't get me wrong if i could play like matt freeman i'd love to <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but i think with a lot of the music like that you know that we sort of lean on like tom petty and the replacements and that the bass players like aren't overly noodly they're quite their stuff is quite tasteful and I, I, I think if you can do it right leave i always this is how i describe like being a good band i think the bass and the drums are like the foundations of a house so if those are solid mm -hmm. You let the magic, so like the lead guitar and the the, the vocal melodies, a lot like the, the sprinkle and the magic on top that finishes off the house, or like the decorations on top of the house. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've got solid foundations, like the the drummer and the bass player are tight, because there's no point me noodling everywhere when you've got Chino who's playing loads of nice, cool guitar parts that kept that counter like they counter melody to Jack's melodies. Um, so there's no point me me noodling everywhere because it just detracts. Do you know what I mean? And I think it's the same with drummers. Like me and Jack specifically are like really big on a drummer sitting in the beat and you know just only filling when you need to fill. Like don't overdo it. Like I like I think Travis Barker's obviously a fantastic dr drummer, but I could not be in a band where the drummer's going <laughs> oh, 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 all over the place because as a bass <laughs> as a bass player that's your worst nightmare. Do you know what I mean? I just want to yeah. be locked in. I know I want to know what the drummer's doing. You I actually found like, a drummer that doesn't play over everything? <laughs> yeah, we, we actually <laughs> have. We actually have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's like, what I, what I love about Nathan is that, like, he's got this little, like, Ringo Starr thing about him. Like, he'll follow, he'll do, like, a a drum fill, but it follows, like, the vocal melody, which is uh -huh. what, a, like, a lot of the Beatles, like, stuff used to do, which is mad. But then he's got, like, this sort of rock and roll. He's like a machine, but, like, he doesn't overdo it. And I think with music especially with the type of music that we play it's like you got to give stuff like space and sometimes when we're writing songs like i'll think a good little bass line can go in there and then we'll all look at christian and go maybe we can put something in there and then we'll just you know like sit on it and just try and think of a part and stuff but um i think yeah i think when when you've got the space to put in a hook just do it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. make it as yeah, hooky yeah. as possible <laughs> if you hear it do it well i i try to you know, I'll, I'll sometimes in recording, I'll go too far, but then I'll just pare it down. So 
This is what's possible. This fits. This fits. But does it really fit within the song? But I'll yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get my my oodles out that way in a way. Maybe it's more of a personal thing. It's like okay, I played that. Now let's erase it. Let's just go straight through or things like that. Yeah. But but I'm kind of thinking live too. I'm thinking okay, is this going to be something I want to do live or not? I used to just put in a fill no no matter what. But uh, yeah, yeah. now I think of a, a little bit about like, okay, I have to play this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, man. it's funny you say that, like, um, like thinking of songs in different ways, because I know when we was writing Primary Colors, we was like, we was, we was, we were jamming it out. And I know Christian and David, for some reason, you stopped playing in like the verses, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were like, shit, that sounds really cool, like, and dynamic, like you've dropped out. Yeah. And it's just me and the drummer playing in the verses. And then we was thinking of like when the Clash used to play, and you'd see like um, Mick Jones and Paul Simonham step yeah, back. Yeah, you'd see like Strummer, Mick, Mick and Paul, and they like sit back, and then like Joe Strummer would be at the front. We was thinking, shit, we need to do something like this. Yeah, yeah. And we and thought then, of then, it like sort of visually on a stage instead yeah, of just thinking yeah. of the song as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. I love that. I think I think that's massively like, like one of my favourite bands. Like live is is well, one of my favourite bands in really is Green Day, and one thing I always remember about seeing them live is like it's a show it's not just it's not it's, it's a visual as well as a gig like you get you know like i don't know what it is like with the clash as well like when when there's a part where it's just joe strummer and the drummer mick jones and paul simonham are back and then when it all kicks in they move forward to the microphones <laughs> and like green day do that same sort of thing and like i think if you can create something it doesn't matter how big the stage is if you're playing to, on a small stage if you can create something that sounds great but looks great as well visually then you know you, you you're onto something special i think yeah i love that no you're right you're right all those bands are great like acdc is a good example of that like uh you yeah, know, yeah sit back and then come up on and sing and sing the back of vocals but uh the uh what is it what is it gonna be like how, how were gigs were you guys touring a lot on your ep when did the ep come out what year the first release the EP was 2018, um, and we, we tried to do as many shows as possible. When we were sort of trying to get tours, we were sort of getting knocked back a little bit. I don't know why. We've always been sort of, up until this point, quite a DIY band. And when you're firing emails out as the bass player to like booking agents and promoters, you sort of get knocked back quite a bit, <laughs> especially yeah. over here. I don't know what it's like there. Um it's but, um, brutal we, we, in the UK. Like it's very oh, corporate, right? Like, dude, yeah, yeah. it's very hipster yeah. as well, very. And um, so we did, we did do a lot of shows on the EP. But um, once we'd done like a fair few shows on the EP, we, we were just focused on writing for the record. So we yeah. um, we got that nailed in. Went out to record with Davey. We were set to tour the record with Social Distortion, and then obviously the pandemic hit. So we've sort of been sat not. We haven't done a show for like well over a so, year now. So, so. Okay, so you went from not getting any shows to you're going to go. To, you went to America, right? We should talk about yeah, you yeah. recording the the record, but to being on a tour slot opening for Social Distortion in the UK. <laughs> how does how <laughs> does one you, do that? Uh, I think what it is is like what it was was we did the record with Davy and um, Davy. He's, he, he sort of, you know, everyone knows Dave. He's a really sort of personable person and he's, he's made a lot of friends over the years. And we just on the off chance said, look, man, send the record to Mike Ness and see what see what he says. And uh, he sent the record to Mike Ness and, and then we just got an email one day off their booking agent. It was literally like midnight here because there's an eight hour time difference. Like, uh, um, do you want to do the social distortion full uh, European and UK tour uh, in 2020? And we were like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me check yeah, my yeah, sketch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's how it came about. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. What's up, Dave? Dave Warsop. Yeah, man. He's been on the podcast. He's a good dude. Uh, I've known him for years. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, good man. to have I can't vouch for Dave enough. I just think he's an incredible, incredible person as well as, you know, an incredible musician and producer. I think he was such like a privilege to work with and like he did. He did make our songs better. It wasn't. We just we had it there and went out, and he just sort of tracked everything and mixed it. It was like he really sort of honed in on what we were doing, and we changed like structures around, and he added sort of his kind of flavour as well. Because I was a massive fan of Beat Union back in the day, like um, 
you know, I saw them live in Birmingham the once and I was like, the energy, it's like, that's what I want in my band. And, um, and yeah, it was just like, when, when the opportunity came, we just said, yeah, let, let's go and do it. Cause it was just, it was just a great opportunity for us. And what so he what, did was, was brilliant. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what do you guys, what did you guys bring with you? What did you, what happened when you got there? We took about 13 to 14 songs and we, we sort of knew in our head what we wanted, what, 10 we wanted on the record but we sort of took a few extras out there i think did you think bring any guitars two, with you yeah, yeah yeah we took we took yeah. just our guitars didn't we okay. yeah in terms of gear it was just our guitars because like davy had everything at hurley like all amps and like everything like that so we just said just bring your guitars over so that's what we ended up doing right on yeah man. that's great so yeah thir- 13 songs 14 songs and how yeah. many how many on the record 10 10, Ten sort of yeah, it's, he, that's he perfect. <laughs> yeah, there was one like there was one song that didn't make it to the record. He wasn't sure. He was like, I think it's more of like a, a second record song because it was quite. It's a bit stripped back, and he was like, I want your first album to have more of like a. Every song's got to have that punch, and looking back, he's completely right. And we had like this sort of chorus which Jack had wrote, and we jammed it out a few times, but nothing else around it. Um, and we showed it to Davey and Davey was like, right, you're going to get this song completed while you're here in the studio. And he said, um, he said, Jack, you go into the vocal booth with your pen and your paper and your guitar. You write a whole song from this chorus that you've got. You three go out and do your thing around Orange County. So we went out for a few hours, um, come back and Jack had wrote this song, completed this song called Worst Gentleman, which is track nine on the record. And it's, it's my favorite track on the record. It captures the whole vibe of where we were. Mm. as in orange county mm. like that americana like road trip sort of song and um yeah and that was down to davy like saying no you he re- we sort of butted heads a little bit a bit on it like we weren't sure we were like oh, i don't know man like we, we've had we've only got a chorus and he was like i don't care like i believe in you guys. <laughs> you can get a song you can get this song completed and you will <laughs> otherwise you're not yeah. going home so <laughs> and that, that was great that was a great experience to have because obviously we was only sort of out there for like three weeks in the studio and it was like the pressure was on but it was like it was positive pressure it was like come on we can we can write a song out here and track it and literally we, we did like the drums and the bass in the same day that i wrote it and then um and then i just said to davy i wanted to sort of hone down on the lyrics a little bit more so i think i took i think we took the next day off and we went down to like newport beach and i was just sitting on the beach just chilling out and just writing the lyrics and it was it was six we just went in the next day and got the vocals down and just built the track up and it was it was a wicked it was wicked to do that process you know what i mean it was always sort of we'd have a batch of songs go out there and track them but yeah. for davy to say now you've got this chorus here that's like really hooky work on it and just just zone out and do it and that was a really sort of really like a nice sort of experience to do that i love that yeah the the way things come together it changes, you know, depending on your environment, depending on what your experiences are and what you're going through. So stress is yeah. too, you know, if you're like super stressed or not stressed that that's, you know, it's like, Oh, I was so relaxed. I wrote a whole reggae record. So mm-hmm. that's what I mean. I don't think I've ever sort of been that sort of zoned in on like writing a song. You know what I mean? It's, you always have these distractions when you're at home or something. And yeah, just to have that time just to go right then I'm focusing on this one thing get it done and it was it was great it was a good like learning curve really for me as a writer like um to get in that headspace and how important it can be yeah that is cool yeah a lot of times when i'm writing especially these days i'll have you know my normal promo stuff podcast stuff and so i have like parts of the day where i'm definitely not in the zone to write but if i have a song i'm working on i'll just listen to the idea you know in the car on the way to the studio or on the way back home or something um, and I kind of get it in the back of my head and then, so I can still go about my business, do my promos, do, do podcasting. And then as soon as I get back for the night, usually that's when I have more time and I can just, I've, I've got it sort of, I can just unlock those ideas and then they just start coming out. And that to me, I don't understand it at all, to be honest, like it's kind of weird, <laughs> but, and if I get, <laughs> and if I have too much stuff to do, then I can't really exercise that thing. But, um, but yeah, it's been cool to just trust that those ideas are just going to come out and I can get, you know, whenever I f- pull out my phone and start thinking about like this, this chorus that I haven't figured out yet. Right. 
yeah. that, and ideas start coming. So, you know, not always, but but uh, I think trusting the process is is huge. And whatever that process is, it's always going to change. Like we've been talking about, it changes almost each time, and that's okay too. But yeah, man. So some some songs can come in like literally five or ten minutes, and you just blast it out, and then some you've just got to be really kind of like patient with. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think. Um, a lot of the record, again, like I think Primary Colours was the, one of the last songs we wrote before we went out there. It was like a really sort of late bloomer. But, um, but yeah, as you say, trust the process. Because it was like, um, and keep going and be patient because if you work hard enough, yeah. you'll get a banger. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just keep going. That's that's the thing. Is just is You can write one good song, you can write two, you can write three. They're not all going to be good. But, but I've talked about this so many times because we talk about songwriting a lot on the podcast. But just just you're not always going to write your best song but a lot of times it's the song you don't think is going to be the hit song that people are going to really love and so that to me is almost like i i trust the process but i don't trust myself sometimes like i think (laughs) the songs i think are going to be big are not and the songs that are you know it's vice versa so yeah it's it's mad you say that actually mark because i think um I've, I've spoke about this before with Jack. Like, for us, when, when once the record was done and we was we were sort of firing it out to people, um, to gauge like opinions and stuff, we had like a few record labels actually come back and they were like, "Ah, oh, why don't you like release them as like, why don't you release it as like ten singles or do two EPs?" And like with us again, going back to the sort of music we love and the music we listen to, it's it's, it's records as opposed to like singles. So like. With us, we released four singles off the record, but I still think, as, as much as I love those four singles, I still think once they put on the record and hear the other songs that aren't singles, that they'll have new fa- people will have new favourite songs. So, like, my favourite songs from, like, Dookie aren't necessarily, like, Basket Case or Longview. It's like Burnout or, like, on London Calling. My favourite song isn't London Calling. It's, like, Clamp Down. Oh, yeah, um, love that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think like if you go in with the mindset of like just just write as many good songs as you can, create music that like you enjoy yourself. I think you're spot on in what you say. Like the, the ones you think people are, are going to have as their favourites aren't always necessarily their favourites. Um, and I, but I think that's the magic of music. I think that's that's what's great. I love like putting on a record. Um, I've heard like three singles off the record, but then there's still another 10 songs I haven't heard. And then I hear like these 10 other songs and they're like, whoa, they're, they're just as good, if not better than the singles. I think that's, there's something special about that. Whereas if you just, if we just put every song out as a single and then we put the, put it, put the whole record out as a, on, re, on like vinyl and everyone's heard the songs already, you lose the excitement of it. And I don't know if that's me being a purist because I know, <laughs> I know there's like the times have changed and you know yeah. we have like a, a convenience culture now but for me like there's still something really special about listening to like a whole album like where the songs the sequence of the record yeah. sits really nicely do you know what I yeah. mean yeah. Like, yeah. Well, we're, we're really big on sort of like track listing and like it took us a while to get like the right formula for primary colours and sort of we always had in our head it was like it was going to be pressed on vinyl so having like a side A and a side B and that that side B horizons is the first track, so it's like we're really wanting to like keep people on that roller coaster. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? We sort of like bring it down a little bit on side A, mm-hmm. but then like hit them sort of hard in the gut <laughs> for like side B and they're straight back in. Yeah, and that's sort of our sort of mentality on it. Like we listen to you know all timeless music, and that's what we're trying to sort of achieve as well. I think having it thought out is good. And yes, you are a purist, Christian, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I don't, I'm not that hardcore, but I think, you know, I think having a mix of both modern styles of releasing music and, you know, the old school style is good. Uh, I think now and again, you want to put out a record. It's for the f- records are for fans. They're for fans. They're not for record labels because record labels make more money on singles or whatever, but fans want a collection of music usually. So I try to be somewhat respectful or not respectful i guess that's the wrong way to say it uh thoughtful of that um tiktok you know the strategy is to put up like three four five songs on tiktok from a record that's not released yet to see you know what tiktok you know the tiktok audience picks up and starts dancing to you know so things like that this is for more hip-hop promo and stuff like that but i'm sure it could work somewhat across the board but 
just things like that. It's like it's a it's a mo- a modern way of of advertising, which is basically they have no idea what people are gonna like. So let's just give them everything and then see what they like and then put money towards that track. That's the TikTok strategy. So, uh, you know, what you guys are doing is perfectly fine. It is old school and it's not like you're, uh, we told Tooth and Nail Records when they released Secret Weapon, no, don't waste a bunch of money on traditional advertising. And they did anyway. So maybe it helped. I don't know. But that was like, 10 you know 20 years ago almost it was probably like no 15 years ago but still things change rapidly with with promo and marketing and and all that and record labels are always gonna do what is expedient for them to make more money for sure yeah man Uh, for me like you're spot on with all that and like i think we are sort of relatively savvy to all of that sort of stuff but I think it comes back to for me as well, just about the songs. Um, and I think if you've if you've got good songs that aren't sort of gonna date and they're not sort of like a flash in the pan sort of you know hyped up genre, um, this this music that can stand the test of time. I think regardless of like changes in you know marketing or whatever, I, I like to believe that music will sort of rise above all that anyway so if you've got the songs it will sort of it might take longer uh, it will it will eventually cut through it all um i could be being naive but like that's that's what i i believe because i think it all does come down to songs because if you haven't if the songs aren't good people won't like it period do you know what i mean so yeah uh, but yeah yeah i mean it, it, it again i guess it just depends on on where people are looking you know where the eyeballs are at and um, yeah. it's hard to get the eyeballs these days, even though social media is free. But, <laughs> you know, you got to you got to advertise. You have to put some sort of marketing strategy together. And it, in that in that way, it's nice to have a label for sure, because labels are usually a little bit better. But sometimes if you can if you can have a, a, a manager or a partner, a business partner, meaning uh, somebody that's working with you on a business level that's great at marketing. I think, I think it's just individuals that are good at things, to be honest. So a record label doesn't, it doesn't mean they're good at putting out records. It just means they started a record label. So, um, I try to look at the individuals and go, okay, those people are obviously doing creative things. And in the same way, I would look at your band and go, I look at your, listen to your songs, look at your releases, go, okay, they've done a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, the quality of music is really high, uh, for, you know, for what you're doing. Um, so I, I, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of see if you actually look, but at the hard part is, is to get somebody to pay that much attention, you know? So. Yeah, you're right. And it's, it's, it's one of those things as well. Like it's, it's sort of a, pl- a plus and a negative in this, a positive and a negative, like Spotify and like the way social media is gave like platforms for sort of every artist from every genre, um it's great it's amazing because yeah you can promote yourself but it is so saturated that it's hard to you really have to know what you're looking for so like on spotify yeah there's i'm sure there's a million great bands out there that i would fall in love with but i I struggle to find them because there's so many Mm -hmm. um and that's so it's it's sort of it's a catch-22 isn't it whereas like i guess in like the 90s you could sort of I don't know. I, I feel like it was probably easier to sort of find bands back then, which sounds crazy because there was like less internet and like stuff. But mm-hmm. I think like, I don't know. I just feel like back then it was probably, obviously it was easier to make a living back then, easier to make a living being an artist, being in a band. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was, uh, I think if you had the, again, if you had the songs, you'd sort of cut through. And like, I think that happened with a lot of bands. There were lots of great bands in the nineties who had great songs and they all, you know, had had relative relatively good success from it um but yeah man it's just t- times have changed a lot and you you do you have to sort of evolve and adapt and find a way to be unique so that you can cut through a saturated market so to speak mm. so well, one of the things i like about what wiretap is doing is they're putting out a bunch of punk records and and it's a it's a, an eclectic mix of punk rock but not a lot of other labels are doing that you know I mean, there's there's always labels that are doing kind of like, okay, if you're a big band, we'll put you out, right? And it could be, you know, any kind of punk, metal, 
hip hop, this, that, uh, country. But, you know, Wiretap kind of bringing it back to like what Epitaph was doing back in the day and Fat Records and, and uh, doing it for modern bands that are out now is kind of cool. I, I love that. And, and the fact that the fact that I've had so many Wiretap bands on this podcast almost accidentally, you know, people have like hit me up for this or that here and there and I'll check out the record. I'm like, OK, it's actually good. I, I guess I should have him on. You know, same thing. Chris Dougherty, is he your manager? Chris yeah, Dougherty? Yeah. I've known Chris for a while. Uh, anyway, he's a good, good guy, but he, he emailed me and then, I, you know, I finally listened to the record and it was like, oh, OK, all right. <laughs> you know, but you know, it really is about me. You know, I, I'm trying to make this about music, and if the music is good, I wanna, I wanna get it out there. So, congratulations, you guys, man. It's uh, yeah, it's man. a good record. Really appreciate you like listening to the record, Mike, and I'm, I'm proper like buzzing that you dig it. You know what I mean? And you get it. It's like, um, yeah, like really kind words, and really appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. A lot of great songs. I, I feel like you must write songs similar to the way I write them, which is like you have an idea of like this hook and you're not sure where it's going, but then you just, just it, you keep doing it. It comes out and then you bring it to the, you know, I kind of do the same thing where I, I write the song on acoustic, write all the lyrics, everything. And then I bring it to the band and we MXPX fi it or whatever you want to call it. Punkify it. Um, it's, I don't know. It's a cool, it's a cool way to, to work for sure. Um, we should go on tour. <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> let's do it <laughs> yeah, man. Are, are, do you guys have any plans coming up for for future gigs are you still you, the record just came out so is there what's what's next more promo any any live yeah plans? like i think um we're sorting out some like uk headline shows for like towards the end of this year to and sort of promote the record and then um when's everything gonna lost- open up in the uk not sure it's hard to say isn't it like yeah. we, we don't know at the moment because things are half open in the u.s pretty much open in the u.s but still not but people aren't really doing shows yet there's been like a few festivals uh there's been a few shows but it just hasn't been as wide stream as as you would have thought by well it'll be it's the end of june but um anyway you were saying uh so you're, you're booking some some gigs in in the uk towards the end of the year is that going to be like like December, November, December, end of the year, fall, sometime yeah, in the like fall? Yeah, I think we're looking at sort of like September onwards. So okay, like, okay. Uh, and then I think we've got some like shows lined up sort of like November, December time, but they haven't been announced yet, but they're sort of in the pipeline. Cool, cool. So And then, um, and then obviously we've got the social detour next year, but um, we've got sort of about four or five months but that we need to fill really so we're looking at yeah getting some more showers but it's just really hard to sort of judge at the moment it's so difficult because you can get some stuff like lined up and then it'll just be you know just closed again it'll just be a waste of time and it's yeah. it's really difficult that's that's i mean really the main reason why mxpx hasn't really jumped on all the offers we're getting because it's just too soon for it we don't want to necessarily announce a tour or because we're going to do headlining shows and stuff so whatever we do or we could do like a festival or something but we don't really want to announce a festival and be locked into a festival next year it's different for you guys i I would definitely as you guys taking this social detour that's perfectly great uh but just for where we are doing our own thing we don't want to have people thinking about okay well i'm just going to wait till next year to worry about going to see mxpx because it could happen tomorrow i don't know uh, so yeah, we're just yeah, literally, yeah. We're, you know, we're dealing with still, you know, box set stuff and then uh, our live streams between this world and the next. And so we're, we'll be ready. We're playing live a lot together in the studio. And, um, you know, now and again, might throw together a new song. You know, we release new songs and stuff. So between yeah, all of that, we just don't want to. It's, it's hard to plan, like you're saying, because people... They want to book you, but then it'll get pushed back. And I think the thing that a lot of ticket buyers don't understand is is the big promotional companies, the big promoters, the big uh, venues like Live Nation. I'm talking about Ticketmaster, Live Nation. These big companies are all they've all gotten these debt free loans or forgiveness free loans from the government. 
and spanning around the world. So if you're an international company like Live Nation, you're getting not only U.S. money, taxpayer money, you're getting U.K. money. You're getting, oh, we have a venue in, in France. We're going to get some France money. So that all these, these big companies have tons of money, but it's not necessarily safe insurance-wise to go out and just go willy-nilly and do all the shows. So they keep pushing the shows back, and every time they push shows back, they can claim another however you know hundred thousand dollar thing for their venue and uh, you know yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so that's what's happening on the corporate level i think that's why the corporations are fine there's n- nobody's worried at all it's all the the workers it's all the gigs you know the gig workers the the roadies the lighting people the sound people the techs and of course the artists as well a lot of the artists especially independent artists it's very much uh you know, you're kind of on your own. And even if yeah. there are programs, there's so many people that need it, it's very unlikely that you're going to get it. So I always just operate as if I'm an island and, you know, we just got to figure it out because the government ain't coming for us. They're coming for the corporations, just not the, yeah. <laughs> not the independent artists and gig workers. And so we take care of each other as a community for sure. That's what I think, I think our next. Yeah, that's be. it, man. And I think like, because it is sort of controlled by these big sort of corporations and obviously like government based on on our destiny at sort of the moment, if we can go out and play or not. I think the keys for like personally for us is just to sort of stay on top of everything and keep the train going, man. And just yeah. keep like, keep tight, keep writing songs, keep playing, you know, as much as we can. So like obviously we've got our own like lock up where we rehearse and stuff like 24 hour, seven days a week. So we get together all, well, a lot like how, every how week often? and just yeah. like you know just stay on top of everything it's not like we sort of we've never really had like a break from the band it's always been we've got to keep it going and keep on top because i think if if you have a long break i think you know it can sort of lose momentum like internally you know what i mean yeah no that's a very real thing it's it's much like you let a car sit it was working perfectly but you let it sit for a year what well, one the battery's going to be dead after a couple months but Things break. Yeah. Things are just automatically break. Anything electronic here in the studio, if it's not being used over and over, it'll just, for some reason, not work. Like an old computer. Like, why do old computers not work anymore? <laughs> they, should, they worked last time I used them, five years ago. You know, things like that. It's very much the same uh, being in a band. It's like you have to keep your machine oiled. You have to keep maintenance on it. And for that, it's, it's, you know, of course, practicing, rehearsing, but just being together as a group is nice, is good. Um, even if you're not doing, like, quality time st- type stuff, if you're just, like, you know, in there talking about your day and you're not actually getting work done, that's okay, too. Um, but I think any of that is, is very important. The fact that you guys even realize it is, uh, it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Just staying productive, man. Yeah, yeah. I think it's cool to like keep the camaraderie going as well. Because I think if anything, this past sort of year has shown is that like that that's really important. And like, like again, like without sounding like an old punker, but like I think um, bands like The Clash and and Green Day and like those sorts of they have that like gang mentality. And I think like if you can sort of replicate that into your own sort of band, then it's 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 really healthy and. Um, we like hanging out. I'm sure there's times when I piss the guys off and like there's times where we all sort of, you know, we're human at the end of the day. Everybody has, has flaws, but for the most part, we genuinely love hanging out together. And when, um, when Jack comes to a, a rehearsal with a new song, like nine times out of 10, well, I say 10 times out of 10, like I'm flawed, man. And I'm not just saying that, like he'll bring a song, play it. And I'll be like, I'll be literally like swept off my feet, like. <laughs> and, I think, <laughs> and I think that's. I think if you if that if that happens and you're onto something really really good and like, it's even better when it's your mates bringing those songs. Do you know what I mean? So, oh, um, yeah, we just try and keep it like a a real tight sort of tight knit thing, and I think that's the best way to do it. If you have too many like outsiders, you know, giving giving their two cents and giving their opinion and trying to get involved like it, it can become quite distracting um whereas we've always said like it's it's us four and obviously chris now who's managing us like against the world and like that's the, that's the, what we want to that's the way we want it to be and I, I, I love that mentality and i think the clash did it and like 
you know, it's it's just I love that sort of like gang mentality. Like I think it right like gets you gives you that swagger, doesn't it? Like and it gives you like when you when you get into the rehearsal room or when you get on stage, you feel like it's good to feel part of something. So uh, yeah, I, I love it, man, and I'll 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 keep doing it for as long as I keep enjoying it. So very cool. Dude, that's a great, great place to end it. Thank you so much. Christian, Jack, where can everybody find you? Uh, socials or the new record, all of that. Let everybody yeah, know. Yeah, man. So Instagram is uh, Love Breakers Band. We're on Facebook as well if you just search Love Breakers. Twitter, we're on there, but not very much. But it, you, you have to have it these days. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We've got our own website as well, lovebreakers.co.uk, where you can get like merch and buy like t-shirts and our old EP and stuff and I think obviously you can buy the record through Wiretap in US and worldwide and then um, all in vinyl for the UK excellent yeah man dude thank you guys so much Christian, Jack Mike. thanks for doing it cheers Mike thank you Mike it's been, been, a, been a pleasure man honestly thank you so much yeah best of luck to you guys man can't wait to hear what you do next <laughs> <laughs>